meeting is being recorded. The doors are open, everyone's filtering in, grab a seat. Evening, everybody. We'll just give everyone a, everyone a couple of minutes to, uh, to settle in. Yeah, people still pouring in. We'll give you a few more seconds. Righty, I make that eight o'clock, so we shall shall begin, I reckon. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending the first of the 10 webinars that are being run for the FASTER project, which is adding 73 much-needed DC electric vehicle chargers across the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the West Coast of Scotland. I'm Dr. Ewan McSirk. I'm a consultant battery electrochemist by trade, and I'm your host for this webinar series. Joining us this evening, we have Donald Monaghan from the FASTER project, who will give an introduction to what FASTER is and the latest progress so far. And as we move on to the, the wider panel session, we're joined by Roland Kreinen, from the Irish Electric Vehicle Owners Association. We have Neil Swanson, one of the di directors from EVA Scotland, Electric Vehicle Association of Scotland. We have Mark McCall from the Electric Vehicle Association of Northern Ireland. And we have Robert Kazachuk from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Tonight, we're gonna to be discussing the, the basics of charging an electric vehicle. But if you are quite technically minded already, don't despair, because not only are we going to be going back to the basics and explaining the various different plug types and so on that you'll encounter when you're charging electric vehicles, but we'll also be discussing the merits of different kinds of hardware, uh, user etiquette on public charging infrastructure, and also the incentives that are available in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland for installing a charge point on your house, at your workplace, or out in the public realm. So without any further ado, we shall hand over to Donald for an introduction to the FASTER project. Thanks, Ewan, um, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you to everybody for joining us um, this evening. Um, as Ewan mentioned, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what the FASTER project is all about. Hopefully some of you will have um, some knowledge of the FASTER project at this stage uh, and what we're, what we're hoping to achieve. Uh, but for those of you who aren't so familiar with us, um, hopefully the next few slides uh, will give you a better in indication of who we are and what we're doing. So as Ewan said, uh, my name is Donald Monaghan and I'm the project officer for the FASTER project with Southwest College and I'm based in Enniskillen, uh, County Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. So the FASTER project is a joint initiative um, across Western Scotland, Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland border counties, and Northern Ireland. Um, and there's a shared ambition to transition to low carbon transport systems. The project has been awarded 6.4 million uh, funding from the European Union under the Interreg 5A program, which is managed by the special EU programs body, SEUPB. There are seven program partners, um, and they include East Border Region Limited, Southwest College, Ulster University, Louth County Council, and Dundalk IT in the Republic of Ireland, and University of Strathclyde and High Trans in Scotland. Um, we also have 14 local authorities as local part as associate partners, as well as Sligo Institute of Technology and SEAI. As you also mentioned, uh, the project partnership will install and deliver 73 um, rapid uh, charging points across the program region, and those will be 50 kilowatts um, plus. And currently the project is scheduled to be completed uh, by May of 2023. However, an application to extend the project deadline to December 23 is currently awaiting approval from the project funder. 
So where are we at at the moment? Well, in Scotland, we have um, selected a number of sites um, across the region and site assessments have been completed. And our partners at Hytrans have recently launched the public tender exercise to procure the charging infrastructure for Scotland. And that public tender exercise is now live on the official journal of the European Union and will close on the 2nd of May. In the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, site selection and assessment works have been completed. The Republic of Ireland sites have been approved by the Project Review Group and the Department of Transport. Um, the Northern Ireland sites are currently going forward to the Department for Infrastructure and the Project Review Group for approval. Oh, no. Just, just a quick pause, Donald. Uh, you're a lot of folk not able to see the slides at the moment. I don't know if you've moved on or it's not showing properly. Apologies. Um, I'm not sure what what had happened there. Um, yeah. Can you see those now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So apologies for that, guys. Um, as I was saying, the tender exercise is live in Scotland. Uh, there's currently also a market soundings exercise underway in the Republic of Ireland, and that's led by Louth County Council and that will uh, determine the procurement uh, for the Republic of Ireland. Um, sites will feature a mix of single and uh, double units, and so there will be a sort of a mini hub approach. And we will also facilitate AC charging at um, each of the sites. Again, everything will be subject to budget and to the public procurements um, regulations in each of the regions. So in terms of what else we're doing at the minute, um, we have a faster project website, which is now live, and you can uh, get the latest news from the project at fasterevcharge.com. On there, we have a huge range of hints and tips for electric vehicle ownership. We have driver testimonials, uh, we have a savings calculator, so you can calculate how much you can actually save uh, by making the switch to electric vehicles. Don't know your slides are speaking. Your slides are frozen again, just so you know. Don, Donald, if you start the slideshow and then screen share the slideshow when it's running. Okay, I think, well, that, that's pretty much the end of the slides anyway. So um, I think we'll, uh, we'll stop the slides there. Um, but if anybody would like a copy of them, we can, we can circulate those. So um, as I say, it's basically just a, a quick introduction and any questions that we have. Um, we can answer for you as best we can through the chat or the question and answer uh, section. Thank you, Donald. Um, now, we do have a, a quick poll to start off the, the panel session this evening. Uh, we're keen to find out a bit more about you, the audience, and, and what's brought you here this evening. Um, so I believe that we have a, a question that's basically, you know, how experienced are you in electric vehicles? Are you on the market for one? Are you looking to kind of dip your toes in the water? Or are you a veteran EV driver? Uh, Donald, do you have the poll ready to, to upload, please? There we go. So we'll give you a few seconds to, to answer that one. Um, just as I say, because we're, we're curious to see how, how experienced you are or if this is yeah, we do have some novices in here as well. That's good because, uh, yeah, we will be covering, as I said, some of the um, the basics this evening as well as the more advanced stuff. Uh, so there'll be something for for everyone. Looks like a pretty good spread, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, it was obviously edging towards good solid knowledge, which is good. But there's definitely a lot of of, of newbies, which is not uh, not surprising because we are seeing record increase in electric vehicle uptake, uh, certainly within um, within the UK at the end of 2021, one in four vehicles that were sold was, was pure electric, which is absolutely incredible. And we're, we're seeing roughly kind of 100% increases year on year. Uh, I believe that the situation in the Republic, Republic of Ireland is, is broadly similar as well. We're starting to see this real upswell in demand and that's being reflected here. 
So great stuff. We shall end that poll now so that you can, uh, there we go, we'll share the, share the results for you so you can see um, for yourselves. There we go. Is that on screen for everyone? Can you, can you see the results there? Good, good. Excellent. So yeah, actually a very, you know, very good cross section of, of audience here this evening. Fantastic. So on that note, we'll go straight back to basics. But um, before we do, I should point out that we do have obviously the, the chat function, but we've also got the Q&A section. So if you have any questions for the panelists this evening, do type them in the Q&A section and there will be a prize for the best question is asked this evening. Um, so we have some faster branded goodies. There's a, a battery bank for charging your mobile phone. Um, there's a hoodie, a reusable coffee mug, and uh, quite fittingly, uh, quite on trend, some faster branded hand sanitizer, um, given everything we've been through. So yeah, uh, if you fancy getting yourself some faster merch, um, get asking, get involved. Don't be afraid to ask any questions. As I said, there'll be a prize for the best one. So, uh, kicking off on the guide to electric vehicle charging, I have numerous props with me this evening. It does feel like I'm in a branch of Dixon's because I've got that many cables next to me. But, dear panellists, what is this essential piece of kit that we have here for charging your electric vehicle? Tell us more about it's the, the beautiful granny, granny charger, right? It is indeed. <laughs> yeah. No, we can't call it that. that that's terrible. <laughs> terrible. So that, that a mode two charger. Uh, mm. Mode two just means it's got the electronics for controlling the charge somewhere in line on the cable. In fact, if you holds up the box again. Sure, yeah. Yeah, we have the... Oh, I'm not I'm deliberately stand. making you do that. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right. There yeah. we go. So we that's the box standard UK plug, the BS 1633 plug on the end of it. That's something to let you charge occasionally where there isn't other infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, so very handy for um, holiday destinations and hence the name going around your granny's because she doesn't have a home charge point. The other end, of course, is the EV plug that goes into your car. But we were discussing earlier that there's, there's merits and disadvantages to the, uh, the granny cable in terms of only to be used as a, as a backup, really. Um, in terms of consistent use of the granny cable rather than yeah. getting a, a proper charge point, what's the thoughts on that one? Well, the big challenge is that that plug and socket arrangement isn't intended to be used for long term. That so, if you take something like a, a large battery Tesla or a Jaguar with the better part of 100 kilo hours of battery, you're going to be plugged in for two days, drawing about 10 amps. The socket isn't designed to take that. It is going to wear and age, and eventually the contacts will go high resistance, and you'll be looking at a serious fire risk. It's not going to happen occasionally, but regular use. A huge, huge problem. Some chargers, like the Nissan one, uh, come with a, a little device called a thermistor in the plug, where if it senses it's getting hot, it shuts it down. That helps, but you still have the problem that it will get very hot. Anyone uh, who's used one on a regular basis pulled it out the wall and discovered that the prongs in the plug are actually too hot to touch. We'll know exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, there are some... Uh mode two cables that have some some kind of party pieces you have interchangeable plugs at the the wall end of them does anyone on the panel want to want to run through some of those i do actually have a, a convenient prop here um we do have one option if you're heading off camping or something like at your at your campsite so when would you encounter some i mean it's, it's rare that you would encounter this for ev charging but when typically would you encounter the likes of the the blue commando or the red commando Oh, no one's jumping in. It, it's going to be campsites. <laughs> You're still a spotlight, so I guess that's maybe why. Ah, <laughs> uh, could be. No, so typically a 16 amp commando socket or a CE socket, you're going to encounter at campsites for caravan outlets. You'll find it in some industrial areas, some early EV charge points. I think there's still a, a handful in Edinburgh, for example, under Dynamic Earth, uh, or a 32 amp commando outlet where you can use something like that. Or again, the Tesla cable that you're showing is probably the prime example with the interchangeable ends on it. There are other aftermarket devices. Uh, probably the most notable is the Juice Booster 2, uh, which does exactly the same thing. Uh, it's maybe a, a little bit more compact, uh, but it's really fantastic for people, particularly vans making deliveries where there is a, a refrigerator outlet that you might typically use for a refrigerated van and you need to charge. Actually, it's rated, it'll do the same. 
in some cases, some of them a little bit different, but generally it's going to be places where there is infrastructure in place, but not necessarily intended for EV charging. Uh, speaking for myself, I use them all the time. They're fantastic. That's interesting because that makes you probably quite a rare example. I was going to say, Mark and, and Roland, in terms of your experiences and the, the members of your EV owners associations, how often is it that someone will use anything other than your full-on electric vehicle type two, which we'll come on to in a minute, or the three-pin plug? How often is it that you would find someone using the likes of this, this blue commando on the end of a, a Mode 2 cable? Seems I, to be I, increasingly rare. Yeah, I, I haven't think used it. I think it's much. rare that it happens, oh. right? I mean, it's uh, it's it's an, uh, yeah. I say that on a camping site or maybe at a harbor, you will find those charge uh, those capabilities. But I don't think uh, many people have the aftermarket capabilities with those commando plugs readily available. I mean, you still need to get them in order to really uh, purposely do that. I think even uh, most cars don't necessarily come with even uh, a, a a Mo2 charger, right? I mean, that's also not always standard. Um, yeah. In some cars, you uh, you may even have to beg for getting a Type 2 charger uh, added to your car, uh, as I've recently heard with, uh, with Fiat not supplying ca cables with their cars. Unless you really have to beg for them, you can actually get a car with a cable. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we definitely, uh, yeah, don't see that one around that often. Yeah, that, I mean, that is that's bizarre that Fiat has made that decision because the, the Type 2 cable that we'll come on to next is the one that you'll generally find when you're uh, when you're out and about using public charging infrastructure. That's the one that you, you need to use. But sorry, Mark, you were, you were going to say with regards to the probably decreasing frequency that you'd encounter anything other than your Type 2 that we'll come on to in a minute. Yeah, probably have used uh, the, the granny lead a little um, in my own experience. Uh, my wife is a leaf and she does use it quite a bit. Um, when we were traveling actually in Scotland on the Isle of Skye, we stayed on a and b and we were able to charge from the right side three pin. So, you know, I think it's useful and I think it's something that, that uh, it's nice to have in the boot because, you know, in an emergency, you, you can get uh, a three pin socket nearly anywhere in the world and, and, and get moving on. So there's a bit of controversy at the moment because Tesla have decided to remove that from from the boot of their new car so yeah i think i think it's a it's an, a good option but if, if you have a modern ev and you're you're doing any sort of mileage and any sort of charging and you have the capability of taking advantage of a, a seven kilowatt ac uh, then you, you should really be looking at a proper charger absolutely and on that note uh, moving swiftly on to it you mentioned of course you have a leaf is it one of the older leafs or is it one of the newer ones actually well, the 30 uh, 27 all right yeah yeah so you will be very familiar with this end here, which is uh, type one, of course. Um, and of course, this is the other end that you would plug into the public charge point, which is is type two. But um, I mean, obviously, well, Mark, this is is starting to become in the minority, this end. It's, it's typically this, isn't it now? Absolutely. So type one was something that you would find on your early Nissan Leafs on the, the, the Mark one Kia Soul, a handful of vehicles, but uh, Type 2, a bit like VHS versus Betamax, has won the format war. And this is the one that yeah. on your in, public charge points. Yeah. Uh, although, though, this is obviously we're in a, in a close shot within Europe. Type 1 is the standard in Japan and mm -hmm. North America. Uh, type 2 covers Europe. And, uh, you know, come on to the other aspects there. So when you, the old school of you brought in a grey market car from overseas, you will have to maybe think a little harder about it, especially in terms of the, the DC charging. If you're bringing it in from overseas, we are going to see a shift there that will impact how grey markets work. So it's just something to be aware of. True, true. But that said, because every public charge point has the socket that takes that, well, almost every public charge point has the socket that takes this, the, you know, if your vehicle has this, it should oh, no. still remain in. Yeah, uh, I was thinking you're going to have to fork out to convert for CCS type two. Ah, yes, of course. Oh, we'll come on to this in in a bit. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. um, that's going to make things even more fun. But yeah, we we have agreed on a a charging format in Europe, uh, and that is is CCS and and type two that we'll explain in a minute. Um, but yeah, in terms of the yeah you know, the type one and the type two that we've just seen there. When it comes to a home charge point that would go on the side of your 
the wall you know next to the driveway and, and so on um you've obviously got two options don't you so you can either have one that's tethered uh which has a plug on a cable that you would then just plug into the car or a socket that you would take that cable that i just showed there plug one end into the charge point and one into the into the car this one's always um a bit of a kind of spicy debate but uh taking the the panel uh, in turn starting with roland tethered versus untethered and reasons for and against Ah, well, I've actually had both. Uh, so I started off with untethered because there was nothing else you could get uh, yeah, eight years ago. It was all untethered. Um, and then when I had the opportunity to actually upgrade uh, my charge points, I went for, uh, for tethered uh, capability. Reason being is because every time I was coming home, I didn't want to have to open the boots, take the cable out, put it into the wall, and basically in the morning do the same routine in the reverse. Uh, whereas with the tethered cable, you can just roll back the cable and hang it back up and you never have to open your boot, mm -hmm. especially if your your boot is full, you come back from shopping uh, or you uh, you uh, you're going on a trip and you forgot that the cable was either uh, still has to go back in the boot because you're still connected to the car or it's uh, in the boot and you actually filled it up and you realize you have to take it out. Um, so it was always a bit of a pain. Uh, so I went for tethered uh, instead, of course. At the time when I was untethered, I also had a Nissan Leaf type uh, with the Type 1, uh, and we had a Renault Zoe. So it didn't make sense to have a tethered because, of course, the tethered came only in the style of the Type 2, for, uh, or you have to choose, right, Type 1 or Type 2, uh, and you would have to do with converters. So at that time, it made sense. But ever since I um, have both cars now have just a Type 2, it makes sense to be tethered. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing to consider when you're looking at tethered, untethered, I know for me, uh, untethered because it's a small compact box on the wall and the aesthetic very much comes down to personal choice there as well. Uh, I know up in Orkney, people like tethered because that way you spend less time in the rain and the wind. Uh, it, it's, it's an obvious thing. It, it really does depend. It depends what you want inside your house and where you live. Uh, although it isn't something we worry about yet, uh, having... 30 pounds worth of copper coiled up outside your house will carry a risk for some locations. Uh, it's one of the reasons why public charge points in the UK for AC rarely have tethered outlets. True. And um, just to, to cover what uh, Roland was saying there about the Renault Zoe, so it has a Type 2 socket on the car. Here's another example from my car, and this is what the vast majority of electric vehicles on the market today look like. So this is the end that goes in the, the wall, and this is the end that goes in the car. So it's, yep. it's, it's the same kind of Type 2. That's why the likes of um, Tesla's destination charge points are a tethered Type 2, um, even the ones that are also compatible with other electric vehicles. But it's unusual. Um, I would say in, in the Republic of Ireland, as well as, as, as in Britain as well, to find um, you know, tethered public charge points, isn't it? It tends to be a socket that you would plug this end into, because whether it's this or the Type 1 that you saw earlier, you've always got this end of the cable um, yeah. with, your, with your car. Yeah. Uh, worth pointing out that uh, if you and if you hold those two up again, oh, right. yeah, sorry, you've got to stop putting stuff <laughs> no down. I know, sorry, I've, I've got so yeah. many things. I'm just, you just let him do the exercise there. <laughs> I know, I, there I feel bad. He's only a mile from me. <laughs> uh, so, so, one of the things there, you'll notice that uh, if you and pushes those two together, they mysteriously sort of don't go together properly. Mm -hmm. They're actually carefully designed so that you can't plug them and daisy chain them together to extend it. They, they will not make contact. So there is no approved extension or adapter for these cables. And it's something to think about. You can order specialist long ones from various sites if you think you'll need it, but no extensions. And that's worth keeping in mind. Great point. Um, now, in terms of actually, well, actually, before we move on to if anyone's looking to get their hands on one of these um, and sort of your know, costs to install and incentives and so on, um, it's worth pointing out I've gone for a socketed, you know, an untethered home charge point. Um, it's all I've ever had over the years, uh, but it's also because, as you will have seen from those cables, I have one car that has a Type 2 plug on it, uh, sorry, socket on it, and another one that has a Type 1 socket. So it just means I can use the cable from either car without having to um, get an electrician to change the cable on the charge point every time I need it. But my charge point has an app that allows me to do various things with the charge point, including locking a bring your own cable like that in place permanently until I tell it via the app to unlock. So if you have, um, if you decide to go for a socketed charge point, but then decide that you'd rather have 
a cable permanently in it. There are some charge points that can do that and you can just lock a cable in permanently. Um, so obviously now that you're enthused about the idea of uh, getting a home charge point for your electric vehicle, if you don't have one already, um, we should discuss any incentives that are available for installing these. So Robert, you've been waiting very patiently, thank you, um, to tell us all about the incentives that are available in the Republic of Ireland, if you're looking to install a home charge point. Yeah. Uh... Uh, I'd be happy to do that. So we've uh, we've been having a successful scheme running in Ireland for the last uh, few years, where we've given up to six hundred euros for a, a charger installation at home, and that covers the costs of both the, the labor costs as well as uh, for for the charger. Um, there's one uh, particular difference that we've noticed uh, over the years with the UK model in that a person in Ireland is allowed to buy their own charger and then call the electrician to that in UK at least or maybe England when I've looked at it is that you select your installer and then they uh, have a list of approved chargers that they can install for you. So slight differences there, but uh, yep, the costs cover the installation as well as, as the labor costs. And we're recently going to introduce smart charger only requirement in it. I know, again, the UK has done a lot of great work in this in terms of uh, helping it uh, move it forward. So we're slowly going to introduce that as well and maybe in time even reduce it to uh, chargers that are capable to vehicle to grid. Uh, but that's, uh, that's for maybe a different uh, topic so at a, at a high level that's uh, that's our scheme it's it's successful um and uh yeah we're, we're, we're probably gonna keep keep running it for some time yeah superb um a couple of quick points uh, you know good points that you raised there so the the grant um is there a, a kind of maximum percentage of the overall cost that that covers or if it was say 600 euros all in would it would it cover that full amount then yeah very good uh, point yes yeah, so it's it's um a hundred percent up to to 600 and 600 uh they're after. so if if your costs are are be, be, be below 600 uh you you tend to 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 get the the, the full amount and maybe there's a question about uh, whether that's the most efficient way of doing it but that's how we've we've done it uh, and and until now um just to point out the average cost of installation plus the charger that we've seen over the last three years or four years in ireland is around 1200 euros 1300 euros uh for for it so the 600 euro goes towards half half of the costs um but i'm not sure if in the uk that's similar or maybe Maybe slightly different. Um, so that's what we've seen in Ireland. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's good feedback. Good to know. Um, and in terms of uh, vehicle to grid, um, this is something I've been looking into a fair bit recently. But uh, have there have there been any trials um, through SEAI actually of, of vehicle to grid yet, or is that something that's you know, you're you're just kind of keeping an eye on but hasn't been actively deployed in the Republic of Ireland yet? It's a good question. There's been one uh, project on the west coast of Ireland, uh, Dingle, with some rural communities that are at the end of the electricity grid, and um, it often has issues with electricity. So it has. It, it's been a, a very uh, basic trial in terms of just simply trying to feed electricity back to the grid. But in terms of a a, a fully operational uh, and thought out uh, business model, um, I think that the UK uh, definitely has. Uh, done more in the space that than Ireland has done but we're certainly looking to 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 do this uh, more more um and those of actually the last week the government has published its EV infrastructure strategy for Ireland which puts a, a focus on on vehicle to grid as well so we hope uh, they, the, these trials will will become more frequent um as as we go along yeah very interesting. I mean, vehicle to grid has numerous potential advantages, but unfortunately, we only have so much time to cover workplace and public charging as well today. We'll hopefully get a chance to come back to this because, um, yeah, I'm aware that vehicle to grid chargers typically at the moment are considerably more expensive for reasons that we can allude to once we get onto public charging, because um, it's, it's kind of similar technology that's being used there rather than the stuff that's normally on your wall. But thank you, Robert. That's really interesting. Um, so in terms of the situation in Northern Ireland, then, uh, Mark, what's the, the latest incentives that are available for anyone wanting a home charge point? 
Well, it's it's pretty much the same as the rest of the UK, uh, Ewan. Um, it, it's changed lately. Um, it's just now 75%, uh, 350 quid. But you have to be in uh, a flat or in rented accommodation now. Um, so that, that's a change. Um, I think the government views that home charging is going pretty well. It's one of the areas maybe that, that doesn't need uh, as much help as it did. Um, I still think uh, rapid charging is something that they they believe they need help with, and uh, and also um, home charging for people without off street parking uh, in particular uh, still needs help as well. So, hence that uh, the fact that somebody lives in a flat uh, can, can still uh, get some. In, in Northern Ireland, we're told that around a third of homes do not have off street parking, and that increases to over sixty percent in Belfast apparently. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a big, it's a big issue, you know. And, and if uh, someone with a with a, a driveway can charge off peak, um, we we don't have agile tariffs in Northern Ireland, so our cheapest night rates are about 10, 11, 12 p at the minute. Um, but if you compare that to a commercial rapid charging rate somewhere in the forties, maybe at the minute, um, it's going to seriously disadvantage someone who doesn't have a driveway. So it's certainly an area that, that needs to be looked at, and uh, hopefully will be in the future. True, true. And that's that's a good point. So the um, 200, £350 per socket for yeah, residential apartment blocks and for rented accommodation, that used to be applicable to kind of leafy suburbia where you own the house outright and you were just sticking it on the side of your house, didn't it? Yes. Um, and that has now yeah, shifted away from the low hanging fruit to um, yeah, the more difficult to electrify uh, options. That's really that's quite a, a shrewd move that. Um, that said, in, in Scotland, we've we've got some additional incentives, don't we, Neil? We have had and it's sorry, I'm just typing answers to someone in the background. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no worries. The, the incentives are obviously frozen. We're, we're exactly the same position as Mark in terms of the 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 domestic charging, it's really down to people in flats and rented properties. Uh, we expect Transport Scotland to announce, we're in the middle of local elections, obviously, uh, so everything's in purda, no announcements for what's coming. But we're hopeful that we'll see some additional support coming through again for normal home installations. I don't know what level it might be at, and certainly we expect to see the support continued uh, in line with OZEV, so we'll expect some additional funding there. There are, is work going on as well for the on-street charging. Uh, I know we have at least one person uh, attending who's got a lot of experience with the on-street charging work that's being done. Uh, he can join in in the chat and tell people about it if he wants. Uh, if he wants to own up, I'm not going to name. Uh, so th there is stuff coming, but again, at the moment, it's a little bit awkward. Uh, we've got a four-week wait before we really need here anymore. True, true. So well, hopefully we'll be able to provide an update at the, the next uh, webinar, actually, to, to be able to confirm what yeah. the, the actual grants are when they're confirmed. Uh, Robert, you have your hand raised. We'll, we'll quickly take you before we move on to the next bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's uh, just such a simple oversight. But obviously, when I thought of a home, I thought of a house, not necessarily home, but home means both houses and flats and like as the other panelists have pointed out ireland is about to launch um an apartment charging scheme as we call it but it it, it really is focused at uh, what we call multi-unit dwellings so mixed housing complexes be it flats or houses where uh the requirement is for the electricity to come from the shared energy connection we've identified um, a split uh, incentive issue there with regards to the owner management companies and the residents and the infrastructure costs of getting the the, the uh, building ready to have a central uh, connection for uh, providing electricity to the uh, to the cars is important and, and difficult to achieve without support. So as as uh, probably is happening in the UK, where we're shifting to, towards more apartment and more difficult to reach places. But we, we're also going a step further. Rather than providing the cost just for the charger, we're we're working to develop standards with the electric suppliers around how the connection in the apartment buildings can be managed so that it's it's better suited and one um, innovation we've tried to come up with in Ireland is that uh, the, the regulators are going to allow a completely uh, license based model for connections within apartment buildings that are purely dedicated for for that purpose so it's it's effectively try to bring in 
the idea of public charging, but to a, a restricted group of residents where it's it's it, the private sector is encouraged as much as possible to to try and operate these schemes in in multi unit dwellings because um, yeah it's 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 a difficult uh, area yeah. Super. That's great to hear as well. So actually, in, in summary, then, if you are in rented accommodation or in a residential apartment block in Northern Ireland or, or Scotland, that's where the funding is shifting to now. In the Republic of Ireland, um, even if you own your, you know, your house outright and it's that kind of leafy suburbia I described previously, the funding still applies to you. But there's also this new scheme being launched to help people without, uh, you know, without their own sort of driveway and so on. That's great to hear. Um, so yeah, good to see that this is, is actually being tackled in terms of kind of social equality so that you're not priced out um, in terms of the you know, commercial electricity tariffs you'd be paying versus your residential kind of off-peak overnight and so on that you can use to charge your car at home. That's awesome. Um, moving on, uh, another place, of course, that you can charge your car is at your workplace. So in terms of the typical charging infrastructure that you would find at a workplace. Uh, Roland, do you want to kind of run through what most of your, your members of what will we'll typically use uh, when, they, when they go to work then? So um, there's luckily in Ireland uh, quite a number of businesses that are now also providing charge point infrastructure for their employees. Um, I work for, for a company that has, after many, many uh, months of lobbying at the company to get uh, charge point infrastructure placed, uh, typically, they are like seven kilowatt hour uh, charge point units, uh, untethered. Um, and of course, uh, as a result, of course, uh, at the type two and the type one cables can plug into them uh, because, of course, a lot of people also drive Nissan Leafs, uh, the, the, the earlier models. Uh, so, of course, it, it supplies for all. Um, and I see now more and more companies uh, coming in with uh, with their own charge point uh, infrastructure uh, to help with that also because it addresses a big portion of sustainability uh, that a lot of companies are looking at now as well as part of the key initiatives. Uh, and of course, with employees, uh, you know, getting electric cars, uh, you'll see that that indeed those uh, those companies are supporting the employees uh, to go electric and, and having uh, the uh, EV charging point infrastructure. Uh, for some cases, it's very simple, just a charge point, uh, nothing fancy about it. And in some cases, it's uh, with swipe cards and uh, smart uh, load balancing capabilities to, to manage the grid supply for the buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but typically, uh, you'll find, uh, uh, yeah, a seven kilowatt hour, uh, seven kilowatt units there uh, at the customer, at the uh, um, businesses. So just when you mentioned load balancing, because that's something that um, some, of, some of the people who are new to charging infrastructure might not know, but that's where if you had, say, three of those seven kilowatt sockets with a 14 kilowatt uh, maximum grid supply, you could plug in all three cars and it wouldn't draw 21 kilowatts and trip it. It would share the 14 kilowatts between all three sockets and kind of juggle yeah. the electrons accordingly. But you can do that on a much bigger scale as well, obviously, can't you? Um, you can have yeah. tens upon tens of, of, of sockets. Um, so, yeah, unless, well, Mark or, or Neil, I think that's probably a, a fair analysis of, of workplace charging uh, from, from all of our members, actually, very comprehensive. So I suppose we should get to the juicy bit, which is if you have a um you know a, a workplace that you would like to get to install charging infrastructure what incentives are there we'll go for northern ireland first we'll go for mark what have we got for for workplace charging incentives i think it's pretty similar uh, to home again uh, ewan um 350 pounds per socket uh, i think it's up to 40 sockets in, yeah. uh, in the uk so if you're a company with two sites you, you could have 20 sites on each or 20 sockets on each uh, 350 pounds each it's all good. Um, I believe that's the same in Scotland as well, Neil. It is, yeah. So the, the workplace charging scheme is probably it's 75% or £350, 40 sockets per applicant. And so, yeah, uh, spread across however many sites you want. There, there are some rules that go with it as well. Uh, they're not to be used by customers at the premises. Uh, I'm aware that that isn't necessarily followed through by many businesses. Uh, visitors are probably acceptable because they're there as part of work and they don't need to be free. As we've seen earlier, you, you may be asked to pay for it, which is only reasonable. Uh, there are some other things coming where we might see companies encouraged to actually install the infrastructure. And if they can make it publicly available on somebody else's network, we are going to see that coming too. It's more of a commercial incentive. It has the advantage. It also takes cars off the streets into private car parks. There's some really good examples. I think you and you've seen uh, the likes of Vulcan in Oslo, 
uh, which is a fantastic way of dealing with this. So th there are lots of little bits of crossover where you can actually improve the environment more generally and make it more or improve the amenity around towns if you have large pieces of off-street parking. And uh, yeah, it's broadly the same. Yeah, excellent. And um, yeah, are there any additional Scottish incentives within the, the workplace side of things then that kind of top that up even more then? There are, but it's vague. Yeah, uh, again, we'll, we'll we'll know more in the in the near future. Um, yeah. What will be interesting as well is if those charge points have to be added to the public facing Charge Play Scotland network um, as as part of the incentives. It looks like it might not they, be. They won't be. Yeah, uh, a lot of places there's simply not going to be access for people to come in and have a look. So uh, it, it will be up to the the workplace to decide what they do. Obviously, down the road from us in Edinburgh. There's workplace charging that's public domain, uh, just along from uh, Bob's house, strangely enough. Mm. Uh, but not everywhere is liable to do that. Hopefully, true, true. they'll learn and change their mind. Yeah. And of course, Robert, if you're in the Republic of Ireland and you're looking to install charging infrastructure for the workplace, what incentives do we have there? Yeah, uh, slightly different at the moment in Ireland. And I'm actually thinking of uh, trying to explore more how it's being done elsewhere. So maybe even I might get in touch with yourself, Mark and Neil, to find out about the workplace charging solutions where you are. But in Ireland, we have something called the Accelerated Capital Allowances Program, which effectively allows you to get tax breaks. If you pay corporation tax, you get tax breaks on everything to do with the purchase of an electrical vehicle, as well as the associated associated electrical vehicle charging infrastructure so um that's that's a, a nice relief it's uh, it's it's not uh, maybe as as big as 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 uh, some of the other ones where it's per per charger basis but it's still something uh, i suppose it does uh, um, rule out anyone who doesn't pay a corporation tax and maybe in terms of thinking about equity as uh, as you mentioned before maybe there is a need for a workplace charging scheme uh, similar to the one in the uk here so um something to to think further about yeah Definitely. Thank you, Robert. Well, moving on, um, we've also got, uh, of course, public charging infrastructure when you're out and about. Um, and one of the, the biggest differences you'll see is AC versus DC. So I suppose it would be worthwhile explaining the, the technical difference between the two. And I know that everyone on the panel right now is going to be like, oh, oh, I know this one, me, me, me. But uh, I'll pick Mark um, to explain the difference between AC and DC in terms of how that electricity gets into your car. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, you can re-delegate if you wish. I think it's important to say that uh, AC charging is, is the post that you see on on the roadside um, and retail car parks. That sort of thing often referred to as destination charging. This is the the alternating current that everyone has in their own home. Uh, it's also important to say that those aren't really chargers. They're, they're just special um, power outlets with some extra safety features that, uh, for, for AC charging. The AC charging equipment is actually in your EV. So each different EV has different capabilities just to confuse things. So our leaf, for example, can only charge at 3.3 uh, kilowatts. So a 22 kilowatt uh, AC charger on the, on the street, which could add maybe... 80 miles in an hour to some cars will add about 12 miles um, to, to our leaf in an hour. Um, so that, that's AC. DC charging then, um, probably mostly referred to as rapid charging in the UK or fast charging in Ireland, um, is the direct current that goes straight into the, into the battery of the car. Again, your car has different capabilities. So some cars will, will be able to take maybe 50 kilowatts, other cars will be able to take 300 kilowatts. So um, there, there's a bit of learning involved probably, but ho hopefully that sums up the basics of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if you saw my eyes pop when you mentioned it was only a 3.3 kilowatt onboard charger in your leaf. Just to, for clarification, the, the vast majority of new electric cars these days are minimum seven kilowatts, typically 11 kilowatts. And if you're lucky, it might even be 22, but that's quite rare. Um, they'll hoover up electrons very quickly. Um, so in terms of the, the difference in, in use cases for those then, um, I suppose, uh, Roland, if you, if you want to come in, I suppose you could say that a, a rapid charger or 
or sorry, a fast charger, as it's known in the Republic of Ireland, is um, a bit like a petrol pump for electric cars, isn't it? But um, in terms of in terms of etiquette, and in terms of people using it as long stay parking when they shouldn't. Um... <laughs> yeah, um, no, I mean, obviously, it's it's indeed kind of more intended as uh, part of your road trip, if you want to, or you're part of a uh, an immediate need to quickly top up uh, your your car, then you would use that. Typically, um, you know, cars have a rather rapid way of charging up to about 80% of the battery capacity. And after that, it kind of starts to taper off and it starts to get to the AC speeds. Uh, so sometimes even all the way down to seven kilowatts. Um, and then basically you're wasting your time if you spend that much longer uh, sitting on a fast charger and probably uh, making other people a bit, uh, you know, nervous of having to wait for you to finish until you're to 100%, which is uh, really not worth your time, to be honest. Um, yeah, the, these these fast chargers, they are really intended for you to move on. Uh, so typically you, uh, you you top up to what you need and then you move on to uh, to your journey and, and you do the same thing again, right? So if you have a long journey to do where you have to maybe stop two or three times, you would uh, best be best for your time and for your own sanity, uh, leave it up to 80% and then move on to the next uh, fast charger uh, rather than trying to wait until it's 100% because you're waiting for a long time on those fast chargers. If you want to do that, it typically is about the same amount of time it took you to get to 80% to get to 100%. So it's best to, uh, to see 80% and think, okay, I'm gonna stop now, I'm gonna move on. Um, and, and pick the next charger if to continue on my journey, or I just come home and plug it in and charge for a, a lot less than what you do on a fast charger. Absolutely. Uh, bang on. And actually, just to, to further confuse matters, though, of course, we should very quickly explain the different plug types that we will see <laughs> on a rapid charger. So a typical or fast charger, a typical triple headed one, you'll have your Chadamo that looks like that. So, Mark, that will probably be quite familiar to your leaf, won't it? Yep. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Robert, presumably it's Chadmo that was used on the uh, vehicle to grid trial that you were talking about. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. The one that people know, yeah. So this is the, the Japanese standard from you know 2010 ish um, was super reliable, straight out of the box, capable of feeding electricity back into the grid, had all these kind of magic tricks. But like Betamax, it, it lost the format war in, in Europe. But um, the one that uh, the vast majority of electric cars today have, of course, is this one, isn't it? Uh, CCS. So this is where I was saying about the, the triple-headed rapid chargers. Just to confuse things, though, there will also be a uh, Type 2 tethered cable as well. Um, Neil, do you want to tell us why this typically appears on a triple-headed rapid charger and why it's probably not actually that rapid for most cars? Well, it's only going to work at that sort of speed. I think the, the Zoe, Q Motor Zoe's, are about the only vehicle that isn't a bus or a truck that can use that AC outlet at that speed. Uh, most Zoe's run at 22 kilowatts, uh, which is actually the speed of a normal three-phase AC outlet. So we are seeing them decline. We will keep something there uh, because there's quite an extensive sort of park of Zoe's still out there. Uh, but the new Zoe comes with the option of CCS, as you've shown. Mm. And uh, some councils are now getting to the point where they're copying the commercial networks for us and only putting two-headed CCS and CHAdeMO and the AC is kept away in a separate post at a suitable power level for a Zoe. I think one of the questions we were asking was, why aren't you supporting uh, the Q Motor Zoe's in Scotland? And the answer was because there's 63 of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, exactly. They, they very much lost the format war. They kind of skewed off and did their own thing. Um, and, you know, whilst it was B VHS versus Betamax, I think Renault was doing Laserdisc or something like that, and it just completely fell by the wayside. But that said, you know, they are still usable wherever there is a, a Type 2 socket, and um, you know, they are all over oh, the place. They're, with, yeah. they're, they're great little cars and not just local runabouts. No. Uh, that, that's a criticism that's often levelled at the Zoe, uh, and we, we've recently seen one of our members, I think just over 3,000 kilometres on a road trip in Europe recently. Wow. Uh, and Good they, they are quite capable. Uh, you just have to be thoughtful in how you approach it. True, true. Um, I'm aware, obviously, we, we need to discuss incentives uh, for, for public charging infrastructure too. But before we do, I'll just very quickly take this one in terms of the, the name combined charging system. So have you know, here we have type two, of course, this might look, CCS combined charging system, might look a bit similar. Uh, you'll see that the type two has various different AC pins in it, which aren't on here. 
because your DCs, these two big fat pins down the bottom, and this stuff is is mainly to do with basically communicating with the charger and making sure that it's definitely a car plugged in and not a toaster or something silly. So, um, in fact, that's the point. Has has anyone within the the EV owners associations found that people have actually not even known? That they have CCS on their car because this bit typically has a separate. See how this has got like a bung, like that. There's normally like a separate rubber bung, isn't there? So people who've um, never driven an EV before don't realise that. I, I don't know about people in the association, but I've met people at charge points playing around with an AC outlet and a triple headed unit, not understanding that they can actually charge a hell of a lot faster mm. uh, if they go on to the the other side onto the DC. Uh, and it, it's. An education thing, we, we always say that this is a dealership problem. The dealerships aren't educating people when they buy the car. Uh, and it falls to us all as EV drivers to help people out. And it really is part of the big community in EV driving that we all do that. And it's a real positive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I suppose we should uh, we should discuss, of course, the incentives that are available for public charging infrastructure. And this is going to be quite broad because you, obviously it's, it's horses for courses. You've got your your rapid charging for mainly for for um, you know, for journey charging, actually, as EVA Scotland calls it uh, and as East Lothian Council calls it on its um, its uh, you know, posters and, and things charging infrastructure. And Highland, of course. Yeah, they've all been and listening. Midlothian. They've been they've been reading your guidance document, haven't they, Neil? Because, of course, well, that's the point. Tell us about the, the guidance document that you have it includes etiquette too, doesn't it? It does indeed. So this is something we give out with all our members and there is a, an abbreviated version of it sent out to all new Charge Place Scotland members. And it is what we want to think, not in terms of the speed that the, the outlet gives you power, think in terms of what you're going to use it for, the function. So the DC and 43 kilowatts AC, that's journey charging. That's for when you're trying to get somewhere. But that also includes if it's the only place you have to charge because then it's for every journey. It still makes sense. Destination charging, generally slower. It's when you're arriving something somewhere, doing something, I'm just ignoring home charging, it's purely public domain, and tying the, the name to the, the function rather than the speed. Uh, I know we have a, a question sitting uh, open there from Marcus about the names, and actually it comes down to the same thing. You, you give it the name that explains what people do with it, and encourage proper use just with that sort of little behavioural nudge through the name. Absolutely, spot on. Um, what we'll do then is we'll head across to, to Mark to discuss the various different incentives that are available uh, in Northern Ireland for uh, public EV charging infrastructure, whether it's rapid or, or whether it's um, like on streets residential. Uh, and then, of course, we'll, we'll head back to yourself, Neil, to talk about all of the extra wee Scottish dustings that we can put on top of that but mark uh, yeah tell us tell us what's available for anyone who's looking to install this yeah well i guess the, the one you mentioned the on-street residential charging scheme the the observe scheme is the one that um that we would um be most involved with and um, we have been lobbying councils in northern ireland for the last couple of years probably to claim from this pot of 21 million or whatever it is um those chargers though have to be installed in areas with uh residential areas without off-street parking or in car parks nearby so i believe that the uh northern Ireland's first application was made just a couple of weeks ago um, we have 11 councils in northern ireland and nine of the 11 formed a consortium and have applied for that so we're hoping to hear uh, very soon about that i guess the, the other um money that we know of um the assembly has um, given 350,000 um, of funding towards those local authorities to um, increase the, I guess, 75% of the works grant. So that's that's going to make up the 25% the then and uh, allow councils here to install those really without any capital expenditure. Um, and the other money that we know about is, of course, the uh, the FASTER project that, that was hosting us today. Um, I think almost a quarter of a million in Northern Ireland um, went to... Uh, to fund these sort of 24 chargers or maybe uh, Donald can tell us how many it's going to be but it's looking like around 24 I think in Northern Ireland so apart from that there isn't much going on in Northern Ireland I have to say that we, you know as a group it's been our, our sort of laser focus for the last uh, couple of years 18 months to to work on, on our local assembly here and, and we look to Scotland with envious eyes well, I, 45 million i think the, the minister said at the meeting here um at the launch of the foster project and, and more has been announced since so 
we have a long way to catch up, but hopefully we're on the way. The good news, of course, is that, as you pointed out, the Faster Project is, is here and is going to be installing some, some much-needed uh, DC rapid chargers. But um, we will also have, later in the year, a webinar dedicated to Northern Ireland's EV charging infrastructure. And we're hoping to have some, some key stakeholders from government involved as, as well um, to, to explain the, the somewhat turbulent history in comparison to Republic of Ireland and, of course, in comparison to Scotland with its many shiny EV charging hubs and so on. Um, speaking of which, if we head across to Neil very quickly to cover that, and then, of, cro of course, across to Robert with regards to Republic of Ireland charging infrastructure. But, uh, Neil, um, other incentives within Scotland, I believe that there's... So yeah, there, there, there is a new new fund that was announced just at the turn of the year uh, from Transport Scotland in conjunction with the Scottish Futures Trust. Uh, we're still waiting to see how that will take shape, but it's going to basically be working as a proper private partnership uh, with local authorities and commercial organisations, bringing a bit more in the way of charging and larger scale investment. Uh, there, there are a couple of comments I know that we, we've got in the, the questions there about reliability and management, and this will in part address some of that. Uh, it does vary. Uh, Orcs, there is a, an equivalent fund in Scotland. You and I were talking about this just before we started, uh, but for local authorities, it is an either or. It's not additional funding, and they're going to have to pick and choose. Uh, there may be additional funds coming. We're waiting to get an update on that on the back of some of the funding that's been announced from Westminster. So we may see a little bit more coming our way. Uh, what we're not touching there is what we are seeing is that the commercial networks are making the investment and rolling out the infrastructure. The public funding has been great, particularly in Scotland, it's got us to a surprisingly good place. But it's always worth remembering that was a seed fund. That's to get the network up running, get people driving EVs and create an environment for commercial operators to come in and take over. And we are certainly in the central belt and on the trunk roads starting to see that become the, the, the way forward. And it, it's going to be a, an interesting few years as we go through. Absolutely. Um, I'm aware that we're running a bit tight on time before we can get on to Q&A, but Robert, we absolutely need to have uh, all of the information we can get about Republic of Ireland public charging infrastructure uh, incentives. Yeah, no, happy to share it as well. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, the government's launched its strategy in the last uh, two weeks and they've set out a plan of how we're going to tackle this going forward. And I think um, to what has been discussed before, the business models uh, between different types of public charger will probably mean different types of grants. So the government is trying to move towards a uh, different grant types for different uh, types of chargers. So we have en route, which is the one on the highways, uh, like the one with the, maybe the faster project and a really high speed or even more high power speed uh, chargers where the the, the private sector is probably going to lead mo most of it, but um, you, we also have something that we call destination chargers, where we're thinking of here going to a public uh, a space like a library or the hospital or a library, you know, how do we start to provide charging in, in this destination uh, type areas? And then we have residential on street charging for which we actually have a grant in place at the moment. Um, it's been uh, around for three years and unfortunately it, we haven't paid out a single penny yet. And uh, I know Mark, you mentioned, you know, you've, you've received your first application. I think uh, there might be some way to collaborate there to see. Um, I think uh, local authorities have have lacked, I guess, the, the skills and the ability to deliver and execute these these um, projects. So even though the funding has been available, it hasn't really been easy to 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 make it happen. So there's definitely a lot of complexity um, there going on. And then we hear local authorities here talking about um, charging hubs within the city for people that can't afford to park, don't have a parking space, or uh, if I don't, the lo local authorities don't think there is enough, um, I guess, space on the streets to accommodate on street charging. So um, we have this idea of charging hubs. So the, the public um, charging sphere is, is branching out. And I think what we'll start to see is more targeted grants depending on the, the type of charging that we see. So I hope, I hope that's a good uh, background, yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm aware that obviously we are a bit tight on time just now. I'm just having a look through the Q&A because um, you've, you've been asking some very good questions. I've got to say, John McLean, you clearly want that prize bundle. Goodness me, lots of really good questions there um, for the panel. Uh, I see that actually the, the panelists have been very kindly working their way through um, some of these questions already. Uh, there was a really good one about lamppost charging. Um, the ability to integrate uh, charge points into uh, you know, the actual lamppost column itself and then run off of the, the lighting supply. What's the status of that in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland? Uh, shall we start with the Republic of Ireland, please? Roland and Robert, any information on that? So um, I guess just from a uh, development we've seen in Dunleary, for example, we've seen some projects going on with uh, public uh, charge points being placed into lamppost areas. Um, it's a bit here and there. Um, we would like to see more of that because it definitely is, uh, is something that will be very attractive, particularly in cities um, where we have, of course, a lot of lampposts um, and an opportunity to, uh, to really leverage that type of network to bring uh, charge point infrastructure there. Um, it's been trialed here and there, but it's not necessarily something that uh, we see a lot of county councils picking up as, as mainstream projects. A lot of it is still kind of, we're trying this out to kind of pilot here and there, but we'd like to see uh, our, our county councils moving away from actual pilots, but actually start implementing uh, those technologies which are widely available. And as yeah. for, oh yes, yeah, sir, go on. I was just going to say we've it's something that I've been working quite closely with for the last few months to try and implement uh, just to mention some of the challenges that we have to overcome is um, in terms of regulation um, putting in a meter within the lamppost is currently not allowed in Ireland so that's something we have to change obviously some of the cables running underneath our streets there's not that many records of what even thickness they are and what capacity they have to do so sometimes you might have to physically dig the road to find out the, the cable size and that's another thing to overcome and also Ireland in a lot of cases has the lamppost nearer to further away from the side of the road rather than nearer to the road so once you start factoring in all of these things um, local authorities and other experts have been telling me uh, look it might be even cheaper more cost effective to do a charging hub than it is to dig up the road add street furniture and try to deal with the massive legacy issue it might be fresh to start it might be good to start afresh like you do in i don't know software sometimes right trying to deal with a legacy piece of code might be too too complicated so lots of lots of uh, nuances there i think a little bit true true um neil you've already answered for for scotland in the in the chat saying about how we've moved all of our lamp posts to the wrong side of the pavement basically so it would become a trip hazard if it was up against the curb it'd be fine um down in england a lot of them are, are curb side so it's it's okay again fully aware that there have been many good questions asked here there's a few of the panelists who've, who've requested to be able to answer some live um there's a very good one here actually there's a couple as well that i'll say will be answered in future webinars there was a good one about charge place scotland we will have a dedicated webinar on um, Ch Scotland's charging infrastructure. So we will absolutely be covering that. Please do tune in later in the year. Uh, we'll, we'll post the, the dates later on. Um, there was a, another good one. Neil, you wanted to take this one from Mark Johnson. Um, in the panel's opinion, what's the best format for paying for public chargers? And also what's the best way for dealing with hogging issues? So in, in terms of paying, a lot of people become very keen on the idea of what they call ad hoc payments, pay, paying with a contactless card. And for a lot of private users, that's fine. But private users are not the only people who are going to be out there on this network. And a lot of fleets, a lot of business managers, taxis, where they need some sort of accountancy and management. So the RFID is really handy for them. The future is actually probably in plug and charge, uh, where the actual communication between the car and the charge point in the back office is all managed invisibly. You just rock up, plug in, and it'll all, hopefully by magic, work in the background. There are other options with apps, but at the end of the day, it's what works for you as an individual. There is no one answer that's right for everyone. So it needs to be a mix of all of the above. Uh, in terms of hogging, uh, um, a lot of you will be very familiar with our view on that. You pay the price per kilowatt hour for the energy, and then you pay per minute after you hit the, the limit of time you should be on that device. Uh, this is something that it's not intended to be punitive. It's a behavioral nudge. We recommend about a pound a minute with a short grace period. 
And we've seen that kick in. It has made a difference uh, in, in terms of reducing hogging. Uh, one of the other questions that sort of related to it that was tucked in down at the bottom was uh, the, the, the argument between private and public charging. Do we have any idea how that balances out? The answer is no, not really. Uh, but where we've seen tariffs brought in in certain areas, we've seen the usage just drop away very, very quickly. It's come back as people use it more. But that initial drop away is an indication of people who've realized it's now cheaper to charge at home, which frees the asset up for people to use it who desperately need it. I'm thinking taxi drivers, businesses with vans out and about. And actually kind of covers right at the end Jerry Layton's question about do we have a picture of demand between public versus home charging? And as you yeah. say, as charging tariffs are being introduced, we're seeing more people charging at home. I personally reckon I do about 90% of my charging at home, and that includes my cross-country road trips and so on. Does the panel generally agree that that's a fairly accurate figure for people who do have access to, to home charging oh, anyway? Definitely. Yeah. Um, again, I'm aware, obviously, there have been lots of good questions. I want to try and give an answer to, to most of them. There's one of them. Um, I have to take this as an electric chemist. Neil Elliott, really good question. What will happen to all the batteries at the end of life? Will they be landfilled? Absolutely not. Um, the latest cell chemistries that we've got in electric vehicle batteries are easily on for hundreds of thousands of miles before they eventually degrade to what would be called end of life in an electric vehicle, which is actually still 70 percent of its original capacity. But if that battery could do two or three hundred miles, four or five, 100 kilometers when it was new, um, then 70% of that is still very, very usable. So if you do decide to retire it, once it's very old and out of warranty and things, it ends up going into energy storage systems, either at domestic scale or grid scale, before being fully recycled using one of an increasingly efficient number of recycling techniques that's been developed by over 100 groups and businesses around the world, including the Relib project down in, in Birmingham and Leicester, who are doing some incredible stuff on recycling. Um, I actually have an episode of my humble little YouTube channel, Plug Life Television, that covers battery recycling. So hopefully, I'm aware that this is off topic, um, but hopefully that's provided an answer to what's a very good question. They will not go into landfill because the materials in, are in them are simply too valuable to waste they get fully recycled and in fact battery recycling companies and research groups are saying the biggest bottleneck they have is getting their hands on enough dead batteries because they're all still going strong so um in terms of yeah donald you said you wanted to ask uh, another question that's uh, you know not uh, it's a bit left field of, of what we're talking about today but it is a good one from uh, from jack a McBerty. uh so i have concerns about being blind and unable to hear the cars um if the sound is optional it'll make life more difficult for blind and visually impaired people I want to know uh, how we can be ensure, uh, ensure that we'll be protected. Um, incidentally, the, the Nissan Leaf has a very distinctive pedestrian warning noise at low speed. And my party piece is even in a busy city centre, I can pick out one that's, uh, that's behind me at least 100 metres away um, because you can hear that distinct noise. But Donald, you wanted to, to take this one. Sorry, Ewan. Um, no, it was just um, because the question had disappeared from my view. Oh, <laughs> um, that was that was the message. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so basically, yeah. In terms of in terms of uh, you know the, the sound being optional, I mean, the, I believe, and I'm sure that the, the panel will be able to to confirm this so that uh, the the pedestrian warning noise is is now mandatory under EU legislation. Is that right? Yeah. For new vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah, so you will you will hear them coming. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, as as intrusive as an internal combustion engine, but it's definitely audible. Um, well, so. even some cars have a lovely melody. Uh, I believe the Fiat Five Hundred has now this little uh, <laughs> melody coming <laughs> yeah. through. If if it drives by, it gives you yeah. a nice uh, uh, it, orchestra. It, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. Up in Dundee, they obviously have a small fleet of electric refuse collection vehicles. And one of the criteria that they had imposed on them by their health and safety team at the council was these beautiful silent refuse collection vehicles must make at least half the noise of a diesel lorry so that people know they're coming. Madness. There you go. Um, again, trying to get through as many of your good questions as I can. John, another good one from you. Has undercar inductive charging died a death? And I see that Andrew McGinley has also been watching Fully Charged because you've mentioned the Jaguar I-Pace taxis in Oslo that are using some, some quite substantial uh, fast slash rapid uh, charging 
inductive charging pads it seems to be working very well but i'd be intrigued um robert uh if you're if you're still there we seem no, to have Robert's lost video gone. oh is he gone oh no it must be yeah. must be technical yeah. difficulties um uh, roland in that case do you know if there's any trials within the republic of ireland for uh not that I'm aware of. I think the challenge with uh, with inductive charging is is not only the uh, supply of of being able to do that in, in the on the grounds and on the streets. It's also the cars need to be retrofitted to be able to handle that. Uh, and that technology itself, of course, is also expensive uh, to retrofit that on the on the car. Um, so, but yeah, I, I'm not aware of any trials currently happening in Ireland, to be honest. Yeah, that's fair enough. I don't think there's any. Actually, there is one in, in Scotland, actually, I can tell you about um, at Heriot Watt University. Uh, so they have a, a, a wireless inductive trial with one of their fleet vehicles. But it is, again, just like with the Oslo trial, retrofitted vehicles that are specific to to that um you know yeah. that, that particular kind of niche there's not really been that standard developed yeah. but where they have been developed by a particular company they are getting increasingly good that said it's probably going to be niche operations like taxi ranks um, absolutely we'll see yeah that. um although uh, that's a, um, no no I mean, we'll see also for buses there's there's liable to be inductive charging with buses uh, where it's not practical to fit, fit in things like pantograph charging uh, and uh, you and you you've seen the images of the the inductive charging ferry across in Norway, it charges up in the megawatt scale. Yeah. It can be done, but it, it's a very much the niche case. Otherwise, you are just throwing money at something that isn't necessarily a problem otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, a very quick one uh, for... Uh, yeah, for Mark uh, from D. Lowry, are there any rapid chargers actually available in Northern Ireland? That is a good question because it's been an incredibly painful point, but there is good news on that front, I believe. Yeah, so we, we have 17. Um, well, I, th I think the Dar Department for Transport figures, which include rapid chargers that are in dealerships, for example, there's a Nissan dealership in Belfast that has their own rapid charger. If you, if you count all those, there's around 20 or 21 in Northern Ireland. So Donald's extra 24, 25 are going to double what, what we have. Um, there are two or three other projects that are live at the moment. Um, we're talking to another firm who's going to make an announcement hopefully in the next week or two, uh, which we'll be able to share with, with some more good news. So yeah, all these things are coming. It's not quick enough for any of us, um, but uh, you know we, we are going the right direction. I think the biggest challenge ahead for Northern Ireland is the grid capacity issues we're seeing and grid connection fees. So. But uh, we're, we're working hard to try and uh, push things forward. That actually ties in brilliantly to the final question that we've got time for this evening, which is from Marcus Clifford. In your respective regions, do you feel that the electricity companies have the infrastructure in place to allow more EV points to be installed? Is this a DNO issue uh, more than a, an issue for public charge point installers? Absolutely. I think the DNO, you know, is going to play such a huge part here, but we also have to, to recognize that, that they are um, under the control of, in Northern Ireland's case, a utility regulator, you know, and our utility regulator gets its policy from the Department for the Economy. So there are lots of complex relationships here. Um, one of the charge point operators tells us that the connection costs in Northern Ireland are between two and a half times and six times the, the prices are being quoted for in GB. And I think Ofgem is going to reduce the cost of connection charges in, in the spring of 23 as well. So the gulf's going to be even wider. So it's really a policy piece uh, for Northern Ireland to, to get our DNO the, the, to allow them to, to make the investment that we need. Um, Neil, in terms of the, the Scotland situation. Yeah, in Scotland and the, the UK generally, Ofgem has encouraged the, the DNOs to sweat the assets for the last 20 years which means that there is relatively little reserve capacity in the networks. So how you utilise that and access that becomes a bit more challenging. It's not impossible, but a lot of it will come down to things like smart charging. We didn't really touch on that beyond we have smart charging points earlier, but we are going to see a lot more in the way of possibly time of use tariffs and dynamic load control out on the networks to enable it. When you look at companies like GridServe and the rollout of their electric forecourts, uh, I don't know, I've not visited uh, Braintree yet. Have you been, Ewan? Uh, I have, yeah, yeah, it's a beast. It is. So Braintree, yes, it's got solar panels on the roof. They're there for show. Uh, the real tail on it is the big battery pack in the back corner, which cuts their grid connection costs down because they're basically using that as a peak lopper for the charging infrastructure. They're also capturing the solar generation that they have down the road. So I think we will start seeing 
in certain areas, that type of model creeping in. I know in Dundee, obviously, uh, at Queen Street, uh, there's Queen Street? Uh, Princess Street. Princess Street. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One or the other. Uh, has a, a similar thing on a smaller scale, but still achieving the same thing. And again, it reduces the, the peak demand you have in the network. The interesting thing for Princess Street was that although they put in, I think it's six journey chargers up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they're actually not seeing anywhere near the capacity that's available. Uh, it's even when it's busy and full time, it's underutilized because at different points in the charging curve, uh, you're seeing a relatively flat demand. So it'll be interesting to watch, see how the charging companies roll that out and how the DNOs will react to that. I know the DNOs like to take what's your installed capacity, that's your demand. Actually, that isn't necessary. The charging companies can manage that expectation. Um, before we, we go on to, uh, to, to Roland for, for your answer for the Republic of Ireland in that situation, um, I'm aware that obviously uh, we have, we're, we're into extra time, so if anyone does need to, to drop off, no worries at all, we will not be offended and we thank you greatly for joining us this evening. Of course, there is the slight issue, well, the, the small matter of the prize draw. There have been some excellent questions here. I've got to say, purely for the, the level of, of um, technical discussion that that has generated, Marcus, uh, I reckon you are the winner of tonight's uh, faster merch prize bundle. So Marcus Clifford, if you could please send a little message um, to the faster project host with your email address, we'll get that sent out to you ASAP. Uh, but Roland, yeah, it, how do you feel the DNO situation is in the Republic of Ireland for supporting public charging infrastructure? Yeah, I think there's a couple of challenges that we see. Um, so on the one side, of course, it's it's about network availability. So of course, it's managed by ESPN, uh, the ES, yeah, the ESP networks. Um, we see cases where uh, you know even you know Tesla uh, units have been hooked up, but they can't be activated because the ESPN is not ready yet to uh, get them all hooked up. So they sometimes send there for months, uh, you know, not being able to be commissioned because uh, it's not being hooked up to the grid. Um, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is, um, is that, uh, of course, they control <laughs> control all that or hooking up all the charge points. So it's not necessarily the infrastructure providers. It's the ESPN that actually controls the, uh, the, the, the connection to them. Uh, but also for the infrastructure providers, it's the site, uh, the, the planning permissions, the, the site allocations, uh, where they are allowed to place the charge points. And sometimes you find them then in really odd spots, um, which uh, in some cases, even if you think about it from a, from a public safety perspective are not necessarily ideal. They are in low lit areas, uh, which of course also cause the, the necessary challenges because where you would like to see them is in forecourts, um, particularly on around uh, petrol stations and uh, motorway uh, places where you would like to see them, but sometimes they're just off the beaten track because that's the site they could plan for uh, to put the charge point in because they, uh, yeah, the, 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 I said that the, uh, Petrol stations didn't want the charge point there because they may or may not plan something themselves in the future. So there's, yeah, besides network uh, supply and grid supply, uh, there's, of course, uh, planning challenges uh, as well to overcome. Thank you, Roland. Um, so I think we've got time for one more question. I see that Neil has bagsied it already on the Q&A. Uh, Jamie uh -huh. Forsyth says, working for a DNO in Northern Ireland, this is where it gets very juicy because it's so topical about all of the grid connection costs and so on. We're handling more and more applications uh, for new residential connections incorporating electric vehicle charge points. Uh, we normally require several bits of information relating to the chosen charge point. Um, are home chargers going to become DC or are they going to remain the standard seven kilowatt AC as so many people are trying well, to future proof their connections? Mark, Mark, you actually jumped on that before me. So on you go. Yeah, well, I, I would say that seven kilowatt uh, home charging is sufficient for 99.9% .9 of people. Um, 22 kilowatts available if you have three phase or, or need to get three phase. Um, even with two EVs in our house, um, seven kilowatt chargers fine, you know, so that will be my opinion. Yeah, I, I, it's what do you actually need? If you want DC home charging, you're almost certainly going to be looking at vehicle to grid in which case you're looking at spending rather more money. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about AC vehicle to grid using the, the vehicle's onboard systems to drive AC back into the grid. There are a lot of bridges to cross in that one. Yes, it's technically possible, uh, and DNOs are likely to look for vehicle manufacturers to provide certification on things like harmonics, uh, stability of the output, 
it's extremely unlikely that vehicle manufacturers want to engage in that game. So DC it at, at the home will be vehicle to grid for most people. But again, the benefits, the cost benefits for of it remain to be seen. Uh, our home home energy storage is more likely to be useful and more common. So yeah, AC yeah. usually seven kilowatts because it will be controlled whether we, we agree or not, it will end up becoming a requirement to achieve lower cost energy to have it controlled. So you've got that balancing in the grid where you'll get that demand side response at times or scheduling to match. You know, There's not going to be wind until two in the morning, so everybody just stay off uh, until the hurricane hits and all the turbines spin up. And that is going to be something that as users, it will be there to make our lives less expensive for, for driving. And obviously for heating the house as we electrify heat, uh, slightly off topic, I know. So it is, I think, almost certain to remain AC. Absolutely, yeah. Unless you're driving like a, a, a bin lorry or a double-decker bus back home and parking it on your driveway, you're not going to be going to, to DC, unless, as you mentioned, vehicle to grid, uh, which does actually, I, I'd mentioned earlier when, when Robert had mentioned vehicle to grid, that it does somewhat rely on, on public charging styles of, of technology. So, for example, Mark, your Nissan Leaf and mine can use the Chadamo connection uh, to do vehicle to grid if it has the right kind of vehicle to grid charger. Uh, but that's thousands of pounds worth of equipment uh, as opposed to hundreds of pounds in the case of, of AC, you know, an AC charge point. Um, because, you know, the, the DC, the, the Chadamo and CCS, these DC chargers, the, the actual unit itself, you know, the charge air, is the thing that converts AC electricity to DC. It's the one that's, that's doing, it's basically an off-board charger. Whereas with a charge point, your AC stuff, it's the car's onboard charge air that's doing that kind of magic. So that's that cost is built into the vehicle. Um, and as Neil alluded to, yes, uh, there, there's been theories, that there's been rumors that there'll be bi-directional onboard chargers included in some vehicles soon. The closest we've had so far is the likes of the Hyundai Ionic 5, Kia uh, EV6, and the Honda E have three pin domestic outlets. So if the vehicle is switched off, if the traction battery is not engaged in drive mode, then you can power, in the case of the Hyundai and the Kia, up to three kilowatts worth of, so basically you could boil a kettle, you could run a lawnmower, um, you know, you could do all sorts uh, via these power points. Brilliant cars for camping, incidentally, um, or just for having on the driveway when you're doing the gardening. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm aware that obviously we've, we've run way past the, um, the time. Yet uh, at least 80%, I reckon, of you are, are still on, which just shows the level of interest that there is. And again, thank you so much to all of our panellists for joining us this evening um, and for providing such incredible advice. Uh, a quick heads up, the next webinar is going to be the Wednesday, the 25th of May, uh, at the same time, 8pm. We're going to be covering not only the latest from the faster projects, but we'll be looking at the basics of electric vehicles. So for the almost half of you who are fairly new to EVs, uh, you know, what, what do you need to know? Uh, what options are there out there? Is, you know, are they just little runabouts? No, they're not. Let's, let's find out what's available for you. And we'll have some very talented EV uh, dealers and so on there. Uh, the second half of the webinar Webinar, we'll be looking at how to plan a summer EV staycation road trip. Uh, and we're, we're lucky enough to be joined uh, by Melanie Shufflebotham from ZapMap and Mike Gill from What's Up, uh, who are definitely veterans when it comes to route planning and so on with the fantastic apps that they have available. So we look forward to seeing you there. Um, the Faster team will share the link to that soon. We'll hopefully get a little list up of the webinars that they have coming up later in the year. As I said, there'll be one for Scotland's charging infrastructure, one for Northern Ireland's charging infrastructure, and one for Republic of Ireland as well. So all of those really good questions that you had, those really technical questions, we can really get stuck into them. That's going to be the point of those webinars um, and we'll also look into um you know how green are evs uh was it was it neil did you i think it was neil early off the top of my head had that really good question about what happens to the batteries um so yeah we'll be covering that in in more detail as well uh looking at um ev fleets as well if you're if you're looking to decarbonize your fleet there'll be a, a webinar there there's loads that we're, we're going to have um some of which will be you know, obviously quite uh, accessible to, to people who are new to EVs and some of which we're aware there's some very techie people amongst you. We're going to get fired straight into the nitty gritty. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Where's Donald disappeared to?